Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Nandini, and I'm one of your Athenaeum fellows for this year. Pandemic, economic collapse, protests, natural disasters, virtual political conventions. The 2020 election cycle is different than any other in history, to say the least. We have more questions than answers. How do we frame American politics in the context that we are living in and through? Which states are most likely to flip? Is a pandemic enough to reelect a new president? Here to answer some of our questions about the weirdest election ever by offering his insights on the presidential race and other important election battles around the country while pondering upon a potential new normal in politics is Professor Jack Pitney. Pitney is a Roy P. Crocker Professor of American Politics at Claremont McKenna College. Professor Pitney has worked at CMC since 1986, having served as the Director of the Research Department of the Republican National Committee and Senior Domestic Policy Analyst for the U.S. House Republican Research Committee. Some of Professor Pitney's many publications include the recent Un-American, The Fake Patriotism of Donald Trump, and defying the odds, the 2016 election and American politics. As many of you already know, Professor Pitney is a leading expert on American elections, and it is an honor to have him at the app this year. Professor Pitney will present his thoughts for 20 minutes and then jump into conversation with me and Will. We are most excited to get to your questions, which we will share with Professor Pitney for the majority of the evening. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Student, faculty, parent, alumni, or friend of the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pitney to the Athenaeum. Well, thank you, Nandini. Uh, this is kind of a do-over uh, because as many people at CMC remember, I gave a talk at the Athenaeum four years ago, in which I confidently predicted Hillary Clinton would win the election. And uh, in a way, I, I kind of got it right because she did win the popular vote, but that isn't what chooses the president. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were very surprised when uh, Donald Trump won the electoral vote. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so let's get straight to uh, the screen. And let me share the screen here. Okay, uh, if you can see this here, the weirdest election ever. And let me enlarge it a bit so everybody can see it. Uh, why is it the weirdest election ever? Well, we never had a president who came to office after losing the popular vote by such a wide margin. Uh, people say, well, the polls don't count this time because they were so wrong last time. Actually, the national polls were spot on. National polls indicated that Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote by a modest margin, and by golly, she did. Again, as I said, that isn't what determines the outcome. It's the states. And uh, polls were off in several key states, in part because they simply didn't do enough high-quality polling. This time, uh, the pollsters learned from their mistake four years ago, a lot of high-quality polling in the states, giving us a pretty good sense of where the election might go emphasis on the might, because, uh, again, a lot of uncertainty in an election, uh, given the circumstances. Okay, uh, another part of this. We've never, ever, ever had a president this consistently unpopular, at least in the history of uh, systematic public opinion polling. Uh, and just look at the, uh, at the chart from Real Clear Politics here. Uh, this is uh, the Real Clear Politics polling average, and let me enlarge it a bit so everybody can see. The uh, right from the get-go, uh, President Trump's average job disapproval outweighed his average approval by a pretty substantial margin. He's had his ups and downs, but the lines haven't crossed since he came to office in January 2017. 
if you notice here uh, at the screen, he, uh, there was a little bit of a bounce at the beginning of the pandemic, the so-called rally effect. Uh, in March, uh, a lot of Americans said, well, let's give the guy a chance. You know, maybe he'll be uh, a president who meets the moment. Uh, didn't happen. We can talk about uh, what may or may not have worked for the president at that time. But uh, in the end, a lot of people decided they weren't crazy about the president's response to the pandemic and his disapproval rating went right back up. And there it is. Uh, and uh, to this day, the president's disapproval outweighs his approval by a very substantial margin. Not a good position for a president in uh, a reelection mode. Now, he wasn't terribly popular four years ago. The difference is uh, four years ago, you had a very substantial amount of third party voting. Gary Johnson running for the Libertarians, Jill Stein for the Greens. Uh, not so much this time. Uh, a lot of people who voted third party last time are taking sides one way or the other. Uh, so uh, that's not going likely to tip any states. What else is unusual about this election? We've never had an impeached president running for re-election. We've had impeached presidents before. And Andrew Johnson, uh, those of you who took my Congress class, uh, read about that in Profiles in Courage. Uh, but Andrew Johnson did not seek election in his own right after his impeachment. He was uh, acquitted in the Senate. Richard Nixon, almost impeached, but uh, number one, it happened in a second term. Number two, he resigned before the House could actually vote on his impeachment. And Bill Clinton, he was impeached and acquitted in the Senate, but all that happened in his second term when he ran for reelection in 1996 the impeachment controversy was in the future. So we really don't have a great basis for this. We've never had a president who is uh, uh, this unpopular, never had an impeached president, and we've never had a uh, presidential election going on with a pandemic of this scope. Now, those of you who are public health uh, trivia buffs, uh, and I'm sure you're out there because it's a CMC, uh, might say, well, what about 1968? There was the so-called Hong Kong flu of 1968. Uh, yeah, that's true. In fact, I probably had it. Uh, I, I look back and I had a, what I thought in uh, the fall of 68 was a terrible cold. I probably was part of that pandemic. Uh, but it wasn't nearly as deadly as, uh, as COVID. It didn't affect nearly as many people. You didn't have shutdowns of any kind in the United States. Not really comparable. Uh, he had the great influenza of 1918, but that was a midterm election, not a presidential election. It was pretty much over by the time of the 1920 presidential election. So uh, absolutely unprecedented in presidential politics. Uh, we just don't know how, uh, you know, we don't have a statistical basis for drawing inferences from the past because there is no past. N equals zero to use a st statistical terminology. We've never had an election with so many early votes. As of this afternoon, 80.7 million Americans have already cast a ballot. That number is about equal to 58.7% of the 2016 tally. And uh, within a couple of days, uh, you could easily see the number going over 100 million votes cast early. Nothing like this ever, not even close. Here in California, we do have a record of uh, casting votes early. We have had elections in California where a majority of votes have come in uh, by mail or early voting centers, uh, but nationwide, nothing, nothing close. In some states, uh, we're getting close to uh, the level of early voting that actually exceeds the total vote four years ago. We're pretty close to that point in Texas right now. Montana ranks up there too. We'll talk about Montana in a couple of minutes because there's a CMC connection there. Uh, so a huge amount of uncertainty is injected into the situation by the early vote. How are the early voters gonna cast their ballot? Or does this indicate that there is uh, an even greater anti-Trump movement out there that the polls would suggest that uh, the likely voter screen isn't catching a lot of these folks, maybe. Uh, or maybe there is a hidden Trump vote, uh, so-called shy Trump voters who don't like to talk to pollsters. Unlikely, but just possible. 
Uh, so that brings us to the big question, where do things stand right now? Well, let's take a look at the national polls. This is uh, from 538. Uh, this is a uh, pretty standard website. And nice thing about 538 is they look at pretty much all national polls and they uh, have a rolling average. And you see something pretty remarkable here, uh, right from the uh, time in March where Biden became the presumptive Democratic nominee, right to the present. And pretty consistently, Biden has been ahead of Trump and by a pretty big margin. And uh, we see Biden ahead by oh, close to or, you know, around 10 points. As uh, if you do the math, you can tell, hey, wait a minute, there's still some undecideds out there, maybe, or maybe those folks just aren't gonna vote at all. Uh, if they are truly undecided votes, that's probably not good for Donald Trump because undecideds tend to vote for, uh, tend to break for the challenger. Uh, so if this election follows past patterns, the total popular vote is probably going to be bigger for Biden. But, 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 again, huge uncertainty involved here because of the, uh, the, the sheer size of the turnout, the difficulty of identifying likely voters, and what some Trump supporters say is the phenomenon of the shy Trump voter, people who don't like the national media, don't want to talk to pollsters, uh, don't see any evidence for that, but you can't dismiss the possibility that maybe, maybe, maybe something like that could happen. Uh, so if the election stopped right now, I used to say if the election were held today, well, the election is being held today, but if the election stopped today, uh, pretty certain that Biden would win, but uh, we'll see if anything changes in the next few days. Okay, the electoral vote map, as I said, this is really what uh, decides the election. Uh, so I want to talk about this. Uh, we uh, This is uh, from the website 270 to win, and uh, they have a map. Uh, this is a, a version of the map based on current polls with no toss-ups. Uh, so if you just look at the current polls in uh, the states, even if the, uh, even if the margin is fairly narrow, Biden wins, Biden wins by a pretty big margin. Now they have Ohio as a toss up, that's because the polls are dead even. I'm going to say that Trump carries Ohio. Uh, he won Ohio by a pretty substantial margin uh, four years ago. Uh, just talking to uh, Will, one of the Ath Fellows, native of Ohio. Uh, not a state that has undergone as much demographic change as others. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, literally at the end of election day, uh, Ohio will stay red. So as you can see here, uh, the conventional wisdom is that Biden is going to win. Now this could, now this could go in a couple of different directions. Uh, there are some states that uh, could uh, go in a different path from what the current polls are. So on the one hand, let's say the shy vote is there. Let's say the polls are systematically wrong, not catching an upsurge of Trump support. How could Donald Trump win? Probably he's not going to win the popular vote. Uh, very, very difficult for him to overcome a 10 point deficit in a few days. But if enough votes shift in certain states, then he might be able to eke out a victory. What states could those be? Well, obviously Florida. Uh, let's say Florida, instead of going to Biden, goes to Trump. Well, that gets him up to 210 right there. Obviously, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, he won unexpectedly four years ago. Okay, we'll say Pennsylvania goes Republican. That gets him up to 230. Now his path gets a little more difficult. Uh, certainly Georgia, uh, is a must-win state for Trump, uh, has been uh, Republican in the past, uh, in the recent past. So that gets him up to uh, 246. Uh, Southern state, North Carolina, uh, won it last time. So let's say North Carolina goes to Trump. Now his path gets a little more difficult. Uh, 
Okay, now where do we see this? Maybe Iowa won Iowa four years ago. That's less likely. They've had a tough time in the agricultural economy in Iowa. Biden's ahead there, but uh, let's give it to Trump. Ah, wow. Uh, this is as uh, close as it gets. 271 to uh, 267. Biden is still ahead. This illustrates how narrow the path is for Trump. So he's got to win one of the remaining states. And uh, that could be Arizona. Uh, Arizona was a state he carried four years ago. So let's put that in the Trump camp. Could be one or two other states. Uh, but beyond this, it's really, really hard to see what his path would be. He's way behind in Michigan, way behind in Wisconsin. Minnesota, he lost last time. No sign that he's, uh, he's uh, surging in Minnesota. Uh, don't think if he wins that it's going to be by a larger margin than we see here. Now, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say Biden has a terrific night. Okay, let's uh, re-blue some of these states. Okay, North Carolina, uh, Arizona put Iowa back into the Democratic column, Pennsylvania back into the Democratic column, and uh, Georgia back into the Democratic column. Okay, where else uh, might Biden win? Believe it or not, uh, some people are putting making Texas a toss-up state. Well, let's put Texas into the Democratic column. And uh, suddenly we're getting uh, pretty close to 400 electoral votes. Uh, one or two of these other states might go for Biden. Uh, but I think the, uh, the first scenario I raised is the most likely. I mentioned earlier the Senate map. Uh, a year ago, most people thought the Republicans uh, would hold on to the Senate, but uh, Democrats had terrific recruiting and, okay. Democrats had terrific recruiting in the Senate races and the, um, there we go. We're getting the uh, interactive map here. Uh, and uh, it's likely that uh, the Democrats will win. This is what I think is the most likely outcome starting with the race we're most interested in, the great state of Montana. Uh, Steve Bullock is ahead in the two most recent polls, narrowly. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a very tight race. You can see it going the other way. I think Steve's going to pull it out. One, he's ahead in the most recent polls. Two, you have very strong turnout in Texas. Uh, some of these are uh, very unusual. Uh, we were talking uh, just before going on about Georgia. Uh, you have two seats up in Georgia, the six-year seat, uh, David Perdue, who has made some pretty bad gaffes lately, John Ossoff, uh, who is a very strong, well-financed candidate. Uh, Georgia is changing demographically. I think uh, they win that. There's a runoff uh, likely for uh, the uh, seat to uh, a election to fill uh, a seat left vacant by uh, a retirement, a resignation. Uh, I think in the end, um, I think in the end, the Reaps are going to uh, are going to win that. Actually, I need to reverse this. Uh, but uh, one and one out of Georgia. And uh, those of you who've taken my classes know that in Maine, I've taken to calling uh, Susan Collins, Susan Dead Meat Collins, uh, because she likes to say in the middle of the road and what's in the middle of the road, roadkill. Uh, Democrats hate her because uh, that she has supported Trump on a lot of occasions on the Supreme, uh, previous Supreme Court, and, Demo and Republicans don't like her because of her moderate votes on a lot of issues. Arizona, uh, again, a, a sort of a CMC, a sort of a Claremont connection. Uh, Gabby Giffords, a Scripps alum, is married to Mark Kelly, an astronaut, who is uh, the Democratic nominee. Almost certain uh, Mark Kelly is going to win that race. So I think when all is said and done in the Senate, Democrats are going to control the Senate. Again, you can see uh, scenarios under which you could go the other way. Uh, counting the vote, um, we might not know on election night. Uh, if you're interested, you could go to this page and see 
where various states are going to uh, be processing and counting the vote. Uh, the uh, states to watch on election night are Florida and Ohio, a lot of state, uh, they will be counting the vote early. And if, uh, if uh, Joe Biden wins both Florida and Ohio, end of story, he is going to be the next president. But we don't know that for sure. And um, consequently, uh, even though we can say that Biden is currently a favorite to win the presidential election, uh, as the president of the United States likes to say so often, we'll see what happens. And with that, I yield the floor. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight, Professor Pitney. We've got lots and lots of questions as was certainly expected from students, alumni, faculty and staff alike. So we're gonna dive right into those. Uh, the first question from a student is what kind of litigation you think we can expect after the election? Great question. And a lot of it depends on the margins. If Biden wins key states big, uh, that probably not gonna have a great deal of litigation. Uh, but if key states are very closely contested, uh, in Pennsylvania, for instance, uh, Republicans had a bit of a setback trying to uh, shut off the counting of votes. Pennsylvania uh, changed its procedure to allow the counting of ballots that arrive after election day. Supreme Court uh, said, no, we're not going to intervene yet, but they could intervene after election day because those ballots, uh, the, the ballots that arrived late are being separated from uh, the other ballots. So if Pennsylvania is close, uh, expect the Republicans to litigate that. Uh, and uh, you're going to have challenges in other states, possibly North Carolina. Uh, a lot of it is going to revolve around uh, the mail ballots because that's where most of the votes coming in. The mail ballots, the early ballots, uh, you have 50 states, 50 different sets of election laws, and consequently, uh, the, uh, the basis for the electoral challenges uh, could, be, uh, could be quite varied. But again, all of this assumes that the key states are going to be close. If they're not, uh, then uh, the, the litigation will be something of a sideshow. Next question is also from a student. So she's saying that we have seen a lot of electoral predictions that seem atypical, like potentially Texas going blue. Given the current circumstances, is there any long-term credibility to new trends that emerge this year or will they be written off as anomalous? Great question. And uh, specifically when it comes to Texas, I've supervised a couple of senior theses in the past uh, that predicted that Ted uh, that uh, Texas would go blue. So if it does, uh, Claire Goodrich and Miles Wilson can can really celebrate. Yay! Their <laughs> their senior theses came true. Uh, and uh, you know, it isn't just an anomaly in Texas. Uh, you know, we were talking in my uh, interest groups class. A couple of students in that class are from Texas. Uh, demographically, it has really really changed. Uh, you have, uh, not surprisingly, a growing Latino vote in Texas. Uh, I think anybody who knows anything about politics is aware of that. You also have a substantial uh, Asian American vote uh, in Texas, particularly Indian Americans, uh, especially around the community Sugarland. You know, here at CMC, we had uh, uh, the Pandia family. Uh, they're from uh, Sugarland, and uh, they come from a yeah, very substantial Indian American community. Uh, that community tends strongly to vote uh, Democratic. Uh, you have uh, a large number of educated urban professionals, some of whom are former Californians. Uh, they are casting a very large share of the vote in Texas. And you know, the thing we're talking about today, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, there's a stereotype of Texas as uh, you know, people who go to work on their horses. Well, yeah, some do, but most do not. Uh, Texas is primarily an urban state. Uh, you look at the major metro areas in Texas, that's a, actually a majority of the population. Now, not in, in the not too distant past, the urban areas tended to vote Republican. Take Harris County, encompassing Houston. Uh, that's the home turf of George H.W. Bush, Harris County, Texas. He was Republican chairman in Harris County. 
carried it by a very substantial margin in 1988. If you want a lecture on the 1988 election, I, I got I could talk to you for several hours on that one. Uh, but he won Harris County, Texas, 1988. Fast forward to 2016, Hillary Clinton carries Harris County. Uh, so it tells you how it's changed demographically. Uh, the influx of educated urban professionals, they vote Democratic. Uh, and that's why Texas is uh, heavily contested. I think in the end, uh, unless Biden wins by a humongous margin, Texas is going to go Republican. But I wouldn't be totally shocked, wouldn't be totally shocked if Biden were to carry it. Uh, next question, also from a student, asks about uh, how it seems that a great deal of the Republican Party platform revolves around Trump as an individual. I'll editorially add, my understanding is that the Republican Party actually didn't even adopt a new platform in 2020. It just readopted the 2016 one, including lines about how terrible the incumbent president is. Uh, what do you think the political fallout of a Trump loss would be in this regard about what the agenda of the party is going on? Yeah, let, let's talk about the platform because there's one fascinating aspect of uh, the Republican platform. I've, I've written a lot about platforms. I actually helped write a couple. Uh, I wrote a chunk of the 1992 for Republican platform. Every Republican platform between 1968 and 2016 endorsed statehood for Puerto Rico. Every one. Uh, that was standard Republican fare. And uh, when they announced that they were just going to ditto the uh, 2016 platform, I <laughs> posted about that. I said, that's really, that's very interesting. Uh, obviously, Trump does not support statehood for Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, that could be something the Democrats do if they get into power. But, we'll, we, you know, there may be questions about that. Future of the Republican Party after Trump? Well, well that depends on what Trump wants to do. Uh, I suspect that if Trump loses the election, he is not going to go quietly into that good night. Uh, you know, you know, once you've been president, uh, you really like the attention and everything that comes with being president. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Trump uh, announced after losing that he is planning to run again in uh, 2024. He'll be kind of elderly, but, you know, Joe Biden is kind of elderly. Uh, and uh, this will be a problem for uh, Republicans going into the future especially if Trump loses by a big margin. They, are, they will be handcuffed to him. Uh, now, if you talk privately to party leaders, quietly they will say that Trump is not necessarily good for the long-term future of the party, but they can't say that publicly because of the primary electorate. And the people who vote in pro Republican primaries are very much down with Trump. Trouble for Trump is uh, that, you know, he likes to appeal to this base, but he's never grown beyond this base. And uh, it's enough to control the Republican Party to win primaries. It's not enough to win general elections. And uh, the long term problem, which Republican leaders have recognized for a long time, this base is shrinking. Uh, the Republican base for parties is basically uh, non college educated uh, white people and non-college educated white people who are evangelicals. Uh, that, that share of the electorate will continue to shrink. And if, that, if you're basing your whole party on that shrinking share of the population, uh, you don't have a, a really bright future. And so uh, unless Trump decides to uh, uh, march out of Republican politics, he will continue to be a problem for the Republican party. And Alon wants you to speak a little on Trump's lame duck presidency. If Biden wins, will the Republican establishment abandon him and what powers will be left for him to possibly cause havoc? Uh, great question. And uh, I recommend uh, uh, an article in the Los Angeles Times by Elaine Kmark. Uh, she uh, does discuss this. His ability to, uh, to influence policy in, during uh, the lame duck months is, is pretty limited. Uh, he can issue executive orders, but uh, President Biden coming in could simply undo the executive orders. One power is uh, unchecked. And uh, I hope you both remember this from Gov 20, uh, it's the pardon power. There is no check on the pardon power, particularly for a president 
who was about to leave office anyway. Conceivably, a president, uh, if he sold pardons, could be impeached. But I mean, Trump's on his way out anyway, let's assume. Uh, if Trump wanted to empty the federal prison system, he could do it. Constitution says he could do it. I don't think he's going to do that, but I think uh, it's very likely that every friend of Trump who is uh, in trouble or has uh, either is currently in custody or still has a felony conviction, they're going to get a pardon, including perhaps Trump himself. Now, there's an interesting constitutional question as to whether the president can pardon himself. Uh, there are, you know, legal scholars are divided, but as you know, the Constitution is silent on that issue. One way he could get around it is shortly before the end of his term, he could resign and have uh, newly, uh, you know, short-term President Pence issue the pardon. There isn't a whole lot people could do about that, except that uh, the president cannot pardon for state offenses. And in the state of New York, you have an attorney general and a Manhattan district attorney who would live to bring criminal charges against Donald Trump. And if he pulls something like that, they will. Uh, so one thing you can say about Donald Trump uh, in the future, a lot of uncertainty, but one thing is certain that if he loses this election, he is going to be spending lots of his uh, fortune, however large it may be, and we don't know, uh, on lawyers. Our next question is whether you think that given the current dysfunction of our political system, you would expect that this election will provide uh, momentum for meaningful institutional or structural changes, such as the abolition of the filibuster, I might add, as you mentioned before, uh, addition of new states, maybe reforms to the Supreme Court as well. Yeah, let's talk about that. So also, these are terrific questions. Uh, let's talk about the addition of new states. Like the person to talk to there is actually Matt Glassman, uh, who teaches on our Washington semester program. This is his stuff because uh, uh, he wrote his dissertation at Yale. Matt and I have, have actually uh, uh, lived you know, parallel lives. We had this, you know, worked with the same people at the same graduate school. He actually grew up about 20 minutes from where I grew up. He also worked in the state legislature in New York. And uh, he uh, has some fascinating observations about admission of states because he points out that this is uh, a one, uh, you know, one basic uh, change in the structure of American politics that you could uh, you could pull off without amending the Constitution. You don't have to amend the Constitution to admit new states. Uh, so uh, it provided that Puerto Rico wants to go along, if Democrats have majorities in both chambers, they want to admit Puerto Rico as a state, Puerto Rico is a state. You know, assuming that Biden signs the bill, which I'm sure he would. Um, District of Columbia, uh, all it would take is a, uh, is a statute redefining the District of Columbia as the area around the uh, uh, official buildings, the National Mall and the, the nearby areas, then the rest of it with the residential areas of Washington would become the state of New Columbia. Again, you could do that by statute. Uh, so that, uh, that's two new states, uh, very, very likely to uh, support the Democrats. Uh, that would be a really bold move, but after four years of the Trump administration, I think the Democrats are ready for some uh, bold action. Abolish the filibuster. It depends on the, if they get the majority of the Senate. That's something that doesn't require any presidential action. Uh, that's simply the rules of the Senate. Uh, some of the old time folks in the Senate might be reluctant to uh, change the rules, thinking that they might be in the minority again. I, I'm not sure that's going to happen. But you get a big majority in the Senate, uh, in not just 53, but let's say they, they win some of the uh, uh, more marginal seats. Uh, let's say they beat uh, Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. They beat Dan Sullivan in Alaska. They pick up a few of the other seats that are right now kind of pinkish. Uh, you know, they're up to 55, 56 seats. Uh, might they be emboldened to, uh, to undo the legislative filibuster? Hell yes. Uh, very likely that they're uh, going to enact a series of reforms very early. Uh, the new states uh, abolish the filibuster. We don't know. One thing we're pretty sure of, some reform measures uh, to prevent the kinds of things Trump has been doing, uh, uh, making sure that the nepotism rules apply to the, uh, to the executive office of the president, uh, changing of campaign finance rules, requiring the president to disclose taxes, uh, legislation 
uh, clarifying that the emoluments clause, uh, which is litigated by CMC alum Liz Widra, uh, applies uh, to uh, the activities of the president. That is all, that's a dead bang certainty to pass. And the Disclose Act also, by the way, uh, to uh, provide uh, greater transparency for what is now dark money. The next question is from a student on the topic of the Supreme Court. Given that there are now three justices on the Supreme Court that have ties to the Bush v. Gore case, how worried are you that the Supreme Court will interfere in the electoral process and overturn the will of the electorate? Well, again, uh, Gov 20, the Supreme Court can't simply decide, oh, we're going to uh, you know, change the results of an election. There has to be an actual case or controversy that comes up to the Supreme Court. Uh, yes, it is possible that if uh, there are states that are closely contested and that uh, issue does reach the court, they might, might, might reach a conclusion that, uh, for instance, in Pennsylvania, that, light, that late arriving ballots should not be counted. That's a possibility. And if Pennsylvania turns out to be the pivotal state, that could reverse the results of the election. That is, that's definitely a, a, a possibility to be considered. If that uh, should happen, I think uh, there would be a, a great deal of pushback in the electorate. Uh, you know, it would mean that Trump becomes president and, and uh, they would not be able to uh, pass legislation increasing the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, I think there is uh, there would be a tremendous uh, dissatisfaction in the electorate, which is why I, I think the court might be a little reluctant to go in that direction because uh, they don't want to uh, undermine their own legitimacy. So it's a possibility, but uh, I wouldn't bet my kids' tax tuition payment on it. Our next question from an alum is a quick one. Uh, why do you think that George W. Bush has not made an endorsement in this election? Uh, he's politically shrewd. Whatever you think of his policies, uh, you know, he, he's pretty shrewd about elections. Uh, he knows that his endorsement would be a mixed blessing. Uh, you know, if he endorsed Biden, a lot of Democrats wouldn't be happy with that because they don't like him. He knows that. Uh, so I think it's wise for him to, uh, to stay out. I, I don't think he would necessarily add any votes to, uh, to Biden. He'd give a talking point to Trump and cause a lot of uh, controversy that wouldn't change the outcome. Now, if Trump refuses to acknowledge that he's lost the election, at that point, I would expect him to, uh, to speak out. Uh, but um, again, an endorsement from George W. Bush is, uh, is at most a mixed blessing. The next question is from an alum. Um, if Trump loses, what are, what are your predictions for the leadership and future of the Republican Party? Well, uh, if Trump loses again, he might be tempted to, uh, to stick around, try to uh, influence the Republican party even run again. So that's possibility number one. Possibility number two is uh, round up the usual suspects. Uh, again, another CMC connection, Ted Cruz, uh, married to Heidi Nelson Cruz. Uh, okay, I will, I, I will disclose, uh, I would be much happier if that were reversed if she were the Senator and he were the spouse. Okay, there, I've said it. Uh, but um, uh, I think he would definitely run again. That it kind of explains why he went from being vehemently anti-Trump in the 2016 primary campaign uh, to being a Trump supporter. He knows where the Republican party is and he wants to uh, maintain the support of the Trump base. So Cruz is part of it. Uh, Tom Cotton, who also has a Claremont connection, did uh, graduate work at CGS. Um, you know, very, very hard line on immigration issues, uh, very bright guy uh, and uh, extremely articulate. Uh, you'd see Cotton in the mix, Mike Pompeo, uh, Secretary of State, formerly a House member from Kansas. Uh, he definitely would wanna run for president. Uh, so those are three, uh, Marco Rubio, maybe not so much. He didn't do that well when he ran in, uh, in 2016, he might be part of the mix. And then there are possibilities of uh, other folks who we're not even thinking of, but definitely Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo, Ted Cruz, uh, and Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, uh, she was a uh, supporter of Marco Rubio during the primaries in 2016. 
became very, very pro-Trump, represented Trump in uh, the United Nations. So she has the foreign policy experience, has been very supportive of him during the campaign. Uh, so, uh, you know, she is somebody who could, on the one hand, hold the support of the Trump supporters. And on the other hand, because she is a, an Indian American woman, uh, you know, she would add some diversity to the party in a way that the other uh, candidates would not. Next question comes from a parent asking if you think that Trump will dispute even a landslide win by Biden, and also uh, whether that Pandora's box of doubting the result has ever been opened in the past by a president. Uh, great question. Uh, you know, Trump might dispute a landslide victory, but uh, again, in, in that case, it wouldn't really have any legal effect. Uh, he might decline to concede. So what? Uh, if there's no case that could possibly reverse an outcome in any state, his lack of concession is not going to have any uh, impact on who becomes president on January 20th. A again, the important thing is uh, legal cases, close elections, disputed votes, that's one thing. Simply refusing to make a concession speech doesn't make any, does, by itself doesn't make any difference. Concession speeches, by the way, aren't an ancient tradition in American politics. They really only go back to the middle of the 20th century. Uh, now, one thing that Trump could do that could mess up uh, an incoming Biden administration is refusing to help with the transition. Uh, there is a law, Presidential Transition Act, that allows the General Services Administration to provide, uh, to reckon who the uh, uh, likely president is in the past, that has been uh, the popular uh, has been the apparent winner of the popular vote. Uh, in 2000, they held off until uh, the Supreme Court ruled in Bush v. Gore, so that uh, led to a scramble in the Bush uh, transition. Uh, technically, we don't have a president elect really, really, really officially until January 6th, when the electoral votes are counted before a joint session of Congress. Uh, so Trump could refuse to give any aid until January 6th. At that time, the Presidential Transition Act uh, might allow for, uh, for some uh, government support for an incoming Biden administration, but that only gives him two weeks to get set up. Uh, that would be a scramble. And Trump might decide, okay, yeah, let him scramble. Um, uh, so I think that's, uh, I, I think the biggest uh, danger in case of a landslide victory isn't that a concession will change uh, the outcome, but rather that Trump would simply refuse to cooperate in a transition, and that would make the early days of a Biden, administ Biden administration more difficult than they would need to be. The next question is from an alum. Could violence at the polls or the specter of violence at polls have an impact on election day turnout? Yeah, uh, it could. Um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of it. Uh, I could be totally wrong on that. This is, again, uh, an aspect of the election that's extremely difficult to predict. Uh, I think uh, the more likely danger is if the election is super close and there are disputed outcomes in key states. Uh, at that point, you might get some unrest. Let's I you know, I talked about... Uh, the possibility the Supreme Court might uh, uh, award electoral votes to, uh, to Trump in a disputed election, that could lead to some unrest. Uh, conversely, if they awarded them to Biden, that could mean unrest on the other side. I don't think that uh, election day is going to be that violent. Again, I could be wrong, but uh, partly because it's so decentralized, partly because so much of the vote will already have been cast. So I'm hopeful that uh, we'll have a relatively peaceful election day next week. Next question comes from Professor Kyle in the economics department. He uh, invoked the memory of the post-2012 election post-mortem for the Republican Party, which argued that the future of the party had to be a stronger appeal to non-white voters. Uh, ultimately, he was wrong, uh, that post-mortem was wrong about the direction the Republican Party would go, at least in 2016 and in 2020. Do you think that that's going to be the new direction again if Trump loses next week? Well, uh, again, there's going to be, uh, I think it would be almost unanimous among 
party insiders, uh, the professionals who count the votes, who know what the demographics are, who know what the future holds. I mean, all these folks understand that. The question is persuading the primary electorate. And uh, one of the toughest sells in politics is uh, in a primary, vote for this candidate because he appeals to people who are totally not like you. That, that is not a strong message in a primary, uh, even if it uh, is uh, a, a smart strategy for a general election. That's why Jack Kemp never became president. Uh, again, I wrote my book on the 80, 88 election. Jack Kemp never took off with a Republican primary electorate. That's because everybody was saying, wow, he'd be a great candidate in the general election because he, he applied, you know, he broadened the base of the party. Yeah, but the base of the party was what it was. And they preferred either uh, George Bush or Bob Dole. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one person who might be able to thread this needle is Nikki Haley. Uh, she has uh, built up some Trump credibility, uh, but also she is somebody who uh, could appeal to a broader electorate. Remember, as uh, governor of South Carolina, she uh, uh, took down the Confederate flag, uh, and that's something. Uh, so keep an eye on her. If uh, you know if she is a serious candidate, she might be able to to win primaries and have a broader appeal in a general electorate. But I mean, this is this is uh, you know we're way out in the realm of speculation. Uh, if you look uh, historically uh, at people uh, predicting the future of the party, uh, that there are a lot of people who were the you know the next big thing who ended up being uh, a total fizzle, like. Governor Tim Pawlenty of uh, Minnesota, he actually had, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tim, yeah, Tim Pawlenty, uh, he, um, uh, you know, had a, uh, a big uh, a following. He fizzled out. Scott Walker of Wisconsin, he fizzled out. Uh, so we'll see what happens if Nikki Haley decides to run in primaries. The next question is from an alum. Are voters voting for their party candidate or are they voting against the other party's candidate? Good question. The answer is both. Uh, you know, uh, in my class next week, we're gonna talk about the phenomenon of aversive partisanship. Aversive partisanship means you think the other party is not just mistaken on the issues, but downright evil. And the polls show, yeah, a lot of Democrats think reaps are evil and a lot of reaps think the Democrats are evil. And uh, uh, that's a large part of it. But you do also have a lot of Republicans who really, really, really are committed to Trump. And unlike 2016, you have a lot of Democrats who really like Joe Biden. And uh, one of the problems that Democrats had four years ago is that Hillary Clinton was not personally popular. Uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, in people who disagree with Joe Biden on the issues who maybe would have preferred Bernie Sanders, don't necessarily have the same level of animosity to Biden that uh, maybe they had toward uh, Hillary Clinton four years ago. Uh, so it really is a combination of negative side, aversive partisanship, and positive side, people who really passionately support uh, Donald Trump and, you know, not passion on the Democratic side, but affection for Joe Biden on, uh, on the Democratic side. Next question is also from an alum asking uh, if Trump loses after the election, what kinds of uh, legal action can we expect against him as an individual, either civil or criminal, setting aside the possibility that he self-pardons? Great question. Um, uh, if, you know, setting aside the, uh, uh, the self-pardon. We know one criminal case is a dead bang certainty at the federal level, individual one. Uh, and Michael Cohen was sent to prison and you read the uh, you read the documents and he was directed to commit those crimes by individual one. Individual one is Donald Trump. So you know, basically according to the Southern District of New York, Donald Trump is a criminal. Uh, so conceivably there could be an indictment there. Uh, tax evasion. Uh, a lot of reporting in the New York Times that Trump has done some really dubious things with his taxes and not so much the story that appeared uh, a few weeks ago, but one that appeared last year that pretty much outright accused him of fraud. Uh, so expect tax evasion. Um, Lord only knows the other things that will come out as uh, the a new administration comes in. Uh, but as well, uh, there are a lot of uh, business dealings involving the Trump organization, involving tax evasion, that even if he did uh, pardon himself, 
Again, you have Cyrus Vance, the Attorney General of Manhattan, Letitia James, I'm sorry, uh, Cyrus Vance, the DA of Manhattan, and Letitia James, the AG of New York. They're going to go after him. Civil cases, uh, again, some of the uh, some of the cases uh, coming out of sexual harassment, Trump University, uh, creditors. Uh, this is a guy who's been a deadbeat uh, his entire business life, and he has a long trail uh, of people he owes money to. And uh, some of those debts might still be outstanding, not to mention the debts he owes to places uh, to uh, uh, places like Deutsche Bank. Uh, so they might be going after him in a way that they were reluctant to before. Uh, one prediction is certain if Donald Trump loses, he is going to spend the rest of his life in court. He is going to be hit, facing civil, uh, criminal and certainly civil action for the rest of his life. The next question is, become the moderate wing of the Democratic Party? Uh, well, speaking as a never Trumper, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I changed my registration four years ago on election night. Uh, it's not really a large group. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the polls uh, going into the election, you'll see them next week. The vast majority of Republicans are supporting Donald Trump. And the people who consider themselves never Trump are again, a fairly very, very small group. Uh, Biden might be able to crack the Republican vote a little and that could tip some states. Uh, I don't see a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the people in the electorate becoming Democrats. Uh, among the activists, the Project May and my friends in Project Lincoln, I don't think they'll, they'll become Democrats in part because Democrats are gonna welcome them. Uh, if you look at the positions we've taken in the past, uh, the positions we hold now, not really a comfortable fit in the Democratic Party. Uh, so we few, we happy few, we never Trumpers are going to be politically homeless. Continuing on that uh, future of the political home and returning to the future of the Republican Party, uh, shifting gears, if Trump wins, what do you see as being the second term agenda uh, for the president? Uh, he's been asked this question a few times, maybe you can articulate. An sure. Uh, number one, revenge. Uh, you know, uh, the Justice Department has uh, been somewhat uh, restrained by, uh, you know, the professionalism of people at DOJ. That goes. Uh, there's already a report that if he wins day after, he's, uh, he's going to fire Chris Ray as uh, director of this uh, FBI, and he's going to place a loyalist as director of the FBI. We know that he wants to jail his political opponents because he keeps saying it. Uh, the Justice Department hitherto has been reluctant to do that. Even William Barr, even Barr, uh, who uh, has been willing to go a long way down the Trump road has been reluctant to do that. Well, if he doesn't want to uh, uh, indict uh, political opponents, then uh, Trump will find himself an attorney general who does. If Trump wins, it's also likely the Reaps will maintain control of the Senate. And he can, that means he can appoint pretty much anybody he wants. So I'd expect uh, a lot of activity with uh, the Justice Department going after political opponents. I'd expect them to use the IRS to uh, audit the tax returns of political opponents uh, the way Nixon was planning to do. Uh, in 1972 had he not got caught in Watergate. Uh, and so uh, if we have a session like this uh, in four years, I may have to come to you from federal prison. A popular question tonight has been, if the Democrats get the White House and Congress, what should we expect from them in terms of the pace and the type of legislation they will pass? Well, again, there's some easy things that they can do right off the bat. The reform agenda they've talked about, uh, the Disclose Act, uh, that, you know, that'll uh, pass very easily. The reforms uh, about presidential ethics, those will pass very easily. Uh, when it comes to things uh, like um, uh, health care, uh, one agenda item is, uh, uh, could actually be fairly doable. If the Supreme Court rules Obamacare to be unconstitutional, very likely that they could pass a, a fairly straightforward fix pretty quickly uh, by simply having a, a nominal tax attached to it. They, that, that could happen. Um, as far as uh, a more fundamental reform of health care, again, those of you who've taken my uh, courses have heard this ad nauseum. 
Uh, healthcare is complicated and anything uh, in any movement, any radical movement in either direction is, is gonna get a lot of pushback. So that would be tougher. Uh, so again, preserving and protecting Obamacare, they, they will do that for sure. Uh, single payer, very, very hard to do. Uh, when it comes to other things, say the Green New Deal, uh, you know, climate change is real and Democrats will want to do something on climate change, but we're out of money. Uh, the gross domestic product uh, uh, report is growing, yay, but the federal debt is already 100% of gross domestic product and growing. Uh, that is going to be an increasing problem for any administration in the future. The federal debt is ginormous. Uh, the deficit continues to grow. That's going to have some economic consequences. That's going to be a tremendous constraint on any progressive agenda, whether it's health care or the environment. Again, certain things the Democrats can do straight out of the, uh, bat, uh, straight out of the gate uh, aren't terribly expensive, but the big ticket items, that's going to be really, really tough. We've got tons and tons of questions, but the last one that we're going to have time for tonight comes from an alum uh, asking about our politics, which are more polarized than any time in recent memory, and our media is as well. Uh, do you see that as a threat to American democracy? And if so, what needs to be done to protect it from that threat? Well, uh, yeah, uh, politics is highly polarized. Again, this is waxed and waned in American history. Uh, we have, in fact, had periods of American history when we were as polarized and in 1860, a hell of a lot more polarized. Uh, we're not at the, at, the, uh, at, at the precipice of civil war. So we're at least better than we were 1860, 1861. Uh, but uh, aversive partisanship is not gonna go away. Uh, let's say Biden wins, uh, it's not gonna be kumbaya. Republicans in Congress are gonna try to do everything they can to thwart a Biden agenda, but at least don't make things worse. Uh, and again, I will do a little editorializing here. For four years, we've had a president who definitely made things worse. You know, the tweets, the attacks, uh, everything that we've seen for the past four years, uh, that hasn't helped. Biden at least won't make things worse. Uh, he will try to work with Congress. He is not gonna issue gratuitous insults to his political opponents. He's going to try to speak to our better angels. And that's something. Uh, and that's probably the best we can expect in the short run. Before I conclude, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience? Uh, yeah. This time, vote as if your whole world depended on it, because it does. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Professor Pitney and to all of those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual Ath event, which will be next Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Professor Zach Corser, Sarah Sadwani, Andrew Sinclair, and Professor Pitney will be previewing election night. Thank you all and have a great evening. <laughs>